From the iconic Orange Crush to the infamous No Fly Zone, dynamic defenders have played a vital role in this franchise's success over the last 62 seasons. Effective safety play is crucial for any dominant defensive unit, so it's only fitting that the Denver Broncos have enjoyed a rich tradition of great safeties. Broncos Ring of Fame safeties Austin Goose Gonsolin, Billy Thompson, Steve Foley, and Dennis Smith set the foundation that lured future Hall of Fame safeties Brian Dawkins and John Lynch to the Broncos late in their careers. But it was Steve Atwater who set the bar for those who have since and will someday don orange and blue in the Broncos defensive backfield. Join us as we explore the Hall of Fame career of Steve Atwater, the smiling assassin on the field, the epitome of a true gentleman off of it. Well before the David Baker knock, back-to-back -back Super Bowls, and the unforgettable Okoye hit, an eight-year-old boy from St. Louis, Missouri, was introduced to football on a late summer afternoon. My dad, he came out of the house and said, come on, let's go for a ride. So I hopped in the car and we wound up at this park in St. Louis, Penrose Park, right off Kings Highway. And I got out of the car and, you know, it was just groups of kids uh, playing football in different groups and throwing the ball and, you know, singing these chants. And we got signed up the next day and, hey, that was it. I've been in the football ever since that day. Like other physically gifted kids, Steve was initially drawn to the quarterback position and was tasked with playing on both sides of the field in high school for the Lutheran North Crusaders. When the Arkansas Razorbacks recruited Steve, they could tell whatever shortcomings he had as a signal caller, he could quickly make up for as a big hitter. It didn't take long for Arkansas head coach Ken Hatfield to ask Steve about switching to defense. After like the third day of practice, once I got up there on campus, he called me in the office. He's like, hey, Steve. Uh... You know, if you stay at the quarterback position, it may be a while before you play. But if you move over to safety, what I would like to do is I would like for you to travel with the team with us and get a chance to see the speed of the game, be in the locker room and all these, all that good stuff. So I was like, hey, that's it, I'm good. And plus, it was kind of difficult picking up that offense and I'll forget my stats, my, my passing stats. I was there like 800 yards passing. I, I thought I was the man. I was like, that's not very many yards. <laughs> Uh, but I think he saw in the film, he's like, the guy can't throw, but hey, when he throws the interception, he's going to destroy the guy that that, uh, that catches the interception. So he made that offer. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And I was, I was happy from that point on. As Atwater honed his skills on the gridiron, a medical student on the other side of campus was working towards her own future. When the two finally met, it didn't take long for them to realize they'd found the person they would tackle life with. I was walking across campus and I think I was in front of like the business building and he was a business major, but I just happened to be crossing campus. And that was the first time we actually met. He was kind of, I don't know, like playful, I think when we first met. So I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say immature, but you know, just like a really sweet guy, which was different from guys in college, especially the athletes in college. So he wasn't like that. It was hard for us to really find like quality time together because we were both so focused on what was coming next that it was just really hard for both of us, I think, during that time to just like be together without thinking about like, he's like, oh, I need to go run. I'm like, I need to go study. And so it was like that most of the time. You know, my friends and I, we pushed each other. We all wanted to be better. Coaches pushed us too, but we said, no, no, let, take the coaches out of it. This is just us. Do we want to do we want to be great, you know, and then we just had a whole different mindset, uh, just, you know, the way we approached our offseason workouts and, you know, just building a uh, really close knit uh, team there. As Atwater's time at Arkansas was coming to a close, he had established himself as one of the top players in school history with a record 14 interceptions and bowl game appearances in three of the four years he played in Fayetteville. Despite Steve's dominance at the collegiate level, he was still unsure how much interest he would get from NFL scouts. In that time, he was exactly what people were looking for. Range, intelligence, 
uh, finished plays, understood offenses, new route combinations. I mean, even as a young player, and a lot of guys can make big hits, but not a lot of guys as a 22 year old, a 21 year old can show that understanding. And I think that combination made him a first round pick. Steve might be surprised he was a first round draft choice, but I think anybody who, who followed college football, I mean, it's a rare combination when you have that size of an athlete that has that kind of ability to move and change directions. It was known that Denver was looking for a safety and when the time came at that time, Wade Phillips was our defensive coordinator, Charlie Waters was our defensive backfield coach. And they talked about a couple of guys. It came up in, in a meeting where some of the people like Lewis Oliver, who was a very similar you know, player as Steve. And then there was a contingency of looking for, at Steve uh, at, to make him the, the choice. And we were going back and forth and back and forth. You know, I remember the scouts who, who came out, uh, Mike Hagan and Ron Hill. Uh, I remember uh, meeting them at the East-West Shrine game. And you know, I just remember practicing at the East-West Shrine game. And I was not used to letting running backs, like if they're coming through the hole, I'm going to run up, I'm going to thud you up. And that means like, you know, kind of tack you and then like kind of let you go. But we weren't doing that. and like. I was getting mad, like, hey man, we can't let these guys do this, man. We get used to this. You know, you gonna you get you, I don't wanna get used to guys running through here and nobody's touching them. And we, I was yelling at them on the field, getting our guys fired up, and then we everybody started thudding up and and we ended up doing well in the game. We had a good team, we had good players, and we were looking for a player that has good leadership. And Steve fit the bill. Well, I think everybody in the scouting department coaches uh, uh, really love Steve as far as a player and, and a potential. Uh, but Dan Reeves was really the guy that made the final decision and really influenced everybody that, hey, we needed a safety and we needed Steve Atwater. On April 23rd, 1989, the NFL draft began and the Broncos knew they needed a safety. They made the decision that would change the course of Broncos history. Denver Broncos, Denver's first round selection, Steve Atwater. Defensive back, Arkansas. I had some of my family come down from St. Louis and some of my people from Arkansas over at, at my wife's now. It was my girlfriend back then at, at, her, uh, at her apartment. We had people in, like his whole family was there, and we decided, because he hadn't gone, you know, we were waiting and waiting, and then we decided we'd go out and play basketball, which was right outside of the apartment. So we went and we started shooting basketball between, like, announcements. I remember them sitting in front of TV and, and then the phone ringing. And I just looked over to my wife and looked around the room like, this phone is ringing, like, it's really ringing. We asked her, and uh, it was the Broncos. I remember just the big embrace with his parents. Some of our friends were there and we had like the whole, the food and the champagne and everything. We just had like a really big celebration. I couldn't believe it. You know, we were all crying and it was such a happy moment. Hey, I'm, I've been Broncos through and through since, since that day back in 1989. The late 80s were a time of great success for the Broncos, but a Super Bowl victory still eluded them. But in the summer of 89, a key figure in the franchise's first world title was landing in Denver as Steve Atwater left Arkansas to begin his NFL career. I wanted to come in. I wanted to, I wanted to play early if I could. I've always had the mentality that I want to, want to learn and know what I'm doing. I don't want to step out there if I'm not ready, you know. I want to say sometime in May, I was up here. I was up here going through the playbook, working out. Yeah, Steve, you got it. You got it, Steve? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> we both have a practice. Yeah. 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 Hey. Hey. We'll have to go to practice. We'll have it in practice. Yeah. Well, how about now? I got it How about now? We got to go. We got it now? He wanted to be the best safety in the league and knew that he had, like, big shoes to fill with Ronnie Law and Dennis, people who played at a really high caliber. And so for him, it was like, this is what I want, and I know what I have to do because these are the guys that I'm chasing, so to speak. 
One of the amazing things about Steve when he came in was, yes, I'm the 20th pick in the entire draft. I'm, I'm probably the best athlete on the field, but he was humble. He, he wanted to learn. He, he, uh, he asked me questions all the time. He asked Dennis questions even more. You're in the post? Huh? You're in the post? Yeah, you in zero. So I tell him we up the wing. Just play true. Just, no, just go where he's looking, you yeah? know? Huh? Just go where he's looking. Yeah. I told him everything he needed to know, and he took, he listened to everything I told him, and he became a great player. And I'm proud of that. I always feel like, I always tell him, I like, feel like a proud papa. I feel like I was such a big influence on him because he took everything I told him and he took it to the next level. Hey, they get down this stand, get up. You gotta be up. When he was first drafted, his rookie year, before the rookie year, at the end of training camp, we had a, a safety named Mike Harden. He was a team captain. Dan Reeves cut Mike Harden so that Steve Atwater could start at safety. I remember coming in on the final cutdown day and I remember seeing Tony Dorsett in the locker room, was like, you the man now. I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, they released Mike, I was like, Oh, no, are you serious? And I was kind of, I was sad because Mike was my buddy too. Uh, but then I was really like, oh man, I can, you got to be ready. You're like right now. He was an immediate impact to this team. I, you know, in '89, his first season, I think he had as a rookie 129 tackles, and our defense went from 20th against the run to seventh. And that was in that window where Wade Phillips, I think, first started experimenting with bringing safeties up to support the front seven. Wade Phillips had a way of utilizing at in a certain way. You know, he like on third downs, he would put him in as, take a linebacker out and they would put him in the linebacker position. And uh, they would blitz him a lot from that position on third down. So in this particular play, he was blitzing, but he got picked up. Atwater's on the line of scrimmage and the quarterback has got to be maybe four yards off the line of scrimmage. So. He turns and he throws the ball. Now you would think you would just jump up and try to knock the ball down, but Atwater, he didn't do that. He jumped and he intercepted the ball. I have never seen that done by anybody since. That was the moment for me where I said, wow, this, he is a special player. He could do everything. He could play in coverage. He could blitz. He could stop the run. There wasn't anything he couldn't do, which I think helped recreate the position. His first year he came in and, and actually we led the league in, in least points given up. So, I mean, uh, at, uh, playing safety is a big part of that. And, you know, he made a lot of tackles at the line of scrimmage and made a lot of coverage plays and just uh, had an outstanding rookie year. Wade's an innovator and he, I think he saw, even before a lot of other people, that what, what Steve Atwater could be as a player in the right situation, used the right way. And he just created the defense, and it was one that me and Dennis, we just worked perfectly together in. We the trucks, they the Ferraris. Well, we have some collisions. What happens when they collisions? When a, when a guy driving a, Ferrari, a truck run into a Ferrari, he usually get out and say, damn, you all right? <laughs> it, it was just uncommon to see athletes that big playing safety to be overlooked as a, as a linebacker. The, the running back's hitting the hole and he's looking past you to the secondary. That's, that's a whole different experience. I'm not sure you're gonna find many, if any, better safety tandems in the, in the history of the league. And I can find several people in the NFL right now who say Dennis Smith should be in Canton. Like I said, I didn't know much about the Broncos. I didn't know about Dennis until I got here. And I was like, how do I not know about this guy? This guy is the man. Just being on the field and watching him play, I'm like, dude, I gotta step it up. In pregame, they would always stand at the 50-yard line and let everybody see what the two big safeties look like. Uh, maybe intimidation or whatever, but they said, watch out, we're, you know, we're here. To this day, I look up tape of Steve and Dennis Smith hitting people, and they wouldn't have no money today if they played today. Any and everybody that came through their zone in the opposite color jersey got hit. Dennis and Steve together were a combination that if I was a receiver coming in to play this duo, I wouldn't want to be targeted much across the middle at all. Maybe deep, 
or maybe on the sidelines, but I wouldn't want to come any, anywhere near these two guys. In terms of a tandem of safeties, uh, I, I can't think of two better safeties that have ever played. In the 1990 home opener, under the bright lights of Monday Night Football, Steve Atwater sent shockwaves through the league when he did what no other defensive player had ever done before. Take it to the brother land, baby! Showtime, baby! Showtime in the Maha City! Let's go to work! I remember it started about seven days earlier. My good friend Bob Smith, who really, really developed the concept of wiring for NFL films, and Bob called me on, say, Monday, said, we want to wire Steve Atwater. So he agreed to do it. I'm glad he did, and the whole football world is glad he did. That's why that hit is, is uh, I think, still remembered to this day, because it was mic'd up. Let's go, Salah, go. Hey, got a boy at fullback. I don't give a f he played wide receiver. Hey, hey Christian, on, Christian's ahead. still in. Okoye up the middle. And he is not dead in his tracks. What a hit, Atwater. Wow, Zay what a sock by Atwater. Well, you know, Christian is one of these guys that was 265 pounds, and he actually, you know, ran 4-5, you know, 40. And he was a big man, you know, 265-pound running back, coming downhill, you know, Atwater. He's got him by 100 or more pounds, but um, they collided, and, you know, Steve laid him on his back. I've never seen anybody ever do that to Christian Nicolia. That one play catapulted him to camp because it was mic'd up, and NFL Films captured him saying, yeah, you tried, baby. You tried, baby. <laughs> you tried, baby. I mean, that's, a, that's an all-timer. And, and I don't even think Steve probably realized at that point he was mic'd. It was like everything just kind of stopped for a moment. I was incredibly proud of him. I don't know if Frank oh. McCoy has ever gone backwards like that. I couldn't have planned that if I wanted to, you know, to you know, kind of help him up and talk, say the stuff I said to Tyrone Brown. I don't even know what I was thinking. Why don't you help him up? My game, baby. My game. Hey, my game. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. To actually you know, have the opportunity to make a big hit. So everything just worked out perfectly on that play, and I'm glad that it did. The intimidating force Steve brought to game days clashed with his humble persona off the field. So it was only fitting that he became known as the smiling assassin. I thought it was kind of, I still think it's kind of corny, but it's, I, I think it's kind of cool too because that's kind of how my personality is. I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a happy guy and I used to try and be really physical. <laughs> it was almost like trying to run through a brick wall when he was tackling. And then right after the play, he's like jumping up and smiling again and like had some noise to talk, so. You talk to him and he's a sweet kind of kind, uh, you know, old shucks golly kind of guy. But uh, but you put that helmet on him, it's a whole different animal. The smiling assassin, everybody understands and knows that. They know that he's a you know, fantastic guy, fantastic husband, fantastic dad. But what you could know is the intensity that he plays with on game day. We were uh, taking the field, and, and we'd gone through warm-ups, and of course, I was very, very hyped. I was, I was excited about it. And uh, I hear something from the back of the defense. It was Steve Atwater screaming, yeah, let's go, let's take these dudes out. And I was like, where did that come from? It took me to a whole new level because I was like, finally, somebody plays with the same kind of passion and attitude as I do, and it just shocked me. When you needed somebody to bring it and come up and give a big hit, you know, Atwater was that guy. And uh, on top of that, the greatest guy on the planet and a great teammate, a pro. Um, I just can't say enough great things about him. Always happy, always had a smile on his face, always had a laugh and a giggle. And, uh, and then just would absolutely try to decapitate you. Back when it was fair to decapitate people, now you can't do it anymore, but you know.
In the early 90s, Steve continued to prove that he wasn't someone you wanted to line up across from. He was selected to seven consecutive Pro Bowls, earned two All-Pro nods, and helped the team reach the playoffs three more times by the end of the 96 season. When Mike Shanahan returned to Denver in 1995 as the Broncos head coach, he knew he could rely on Atwater to be a leader. Well, the one thing that was interesting with Steve is when he was drafted in 89, I came back after the fourth game. I was with the Raiders. I was with the Broncos when we went to the Super Bowl. So I had, to be, had a chance to be around Steve, 89, 90, and 91. And then when I came back in 1995 as a head coach, it was pretty easy for me to know what Steve Allard was all about, how well he played, and uh, what a complete player he was and how he handled himself. On offense, they're sort of telling John Elway, look, you have to be a piece of a bigger puzzle. You know, the run game's going to be important. Play action's going to be important. And, and he bought into that. And I think defensively, Steve's on the other side of that. We knew that his system was kind of the 49er West Coast system. And then the offense, they just started just you know, putting up points left and right. I, I would go over there and tell him, hey, man, y'all get ready to go because we know we're going to score real quick. He's like, what? Dude, we're tired. Hell, y'all slow down. I said, dude, do you want us to score points or not? He's like, why? Why don't y'all get some drives? I said, dude, we got TD. We ain't taking drive. We're going to play. We're going to run TD three times. We're going to do plastic pass, pass over the top. One of us, me, Sharp, and Eddie going to catch it. And they say, no, we'll be in the end zone. And they would be pissed because we were scoring too fast. I said, dude, we could be a team that doesn't score. We figured we had that offensive side together. And then, uh, you know, fortunately, we were able to get our defense together. And with Mike coming in, just, I think he instilled a whole nother attitude in us too. And I just think we just felt like we were fresher and we, we were better, you know. We, we felt that, like, all right, we're going this game. We're about, to, we're about to destroy these guys. In the 1996 AFC Divisional Round, Denver was stunned by the Jacksonville Jaguars, but it proved to be the necessary motivation for the Broncos to enter the 97 season with little doubt about what the team could achieve. It also turned out to be the final playoff loss of Steve Atwater's career. We had a really good football team, and for us to lose the, that expansion team was very hard on everybody in the organization because we had a great year being 13-3. We felt like we had a chance to do something special in the playoffs. That game, it was crazy. And I got, I think I had a calf, I mean a thigh bruise that game and I had to come out because I couldn't run. And I felt like I, I let my team down. I'm like, man, I'm over on the sidelines. You know, I, I saw uh, Mark Brunel scramble and, you know, I think he hit Kenny McCardell on the pass and, you know, I'm just sitting there watching. We all took that to heart and our leaders took it to heart even more. And Steve was one of those leaders. And you could tell the last thing he wanted to happen was us to feel that way again. And so he took it personal. He took it upon himself as a leader of the team to do any and everything in his power to make sure that his play led us. Not talking, not jawing. He just played a certain way. Uh, and I think everybody rallied around that. And you just saw play after play after play on defense, which on offense, because of the way we were, we really picked up off of that energy and we went from there. But when we came back there next year, our confidence was at an all time high even though we had lost the game to Jacksonville. Uh, I think we had gotten a few more players on the team and everything just, it just seemed to play out. And we all, we were having the, the best time of our lives. He was a guy that was accountable. You never had to worry about him. He would lead the other players. If he had a, if he had a player on the team that wasn't doing things the right way, he would use his personality and the way he would do it. He's low key he saying, hey, this is how we do things around here. You know. If you want to be on this team, you want to stay on this team, um, we're going to have to do things a little differently. So he was a natural leader. We had a, a team full of great players. And I remember, you know, just kind of looking at our roster, I'm like, we don't have a weakness on our defense at any position. We, we are strong at every single position. Mike Shanahan and the scouts made sure that, hey, we're going to bring the best guys in here to play and we're going to compete. And guys who don't like competition, they are going to be here. He was a true pro, and for me, I was a blessed. I was blessed to be in the room at the time. To me, when he played his best football of his life, I witnessed the majority of it, and, and that for me was special. He just loved football. He loved. I mean, when he'd make a play, 
He loved that. When somebody else on his team would make a play, he loved that. He just was really enthusiastic. And that, that kind of genuine enthusiasm is really contagious, especially when it comes from one of your leaders, a guy that, that obviously is one of your best players. First of all, he got me out of free agency. And one thing that he said to me is that, um, you know, being in free agency, that Neil, you, all we need, you know, to on this defense for us to win the Super Bowl. I love the fact that, you know, Atwater was one of the biggest reason. And, um, you know, he was the defensive mouthpiece that we needed. Yeah, there's the leadership aspect, the playing hurt aspect, all the things that he brought. There's no question that he brought all those things, but just the enforcement aspect of what he brought to the back end of that defense and, uh, and how he was going to punish you. And, and there's no question that teams, you know, had him circled saying, this guy, you know, this guy is, is a legit football playing Jesse. He played exceptional in 97 and 98 in all the playoff games. And I think that's why people, when they go back and look at Steve, they go, oh my God, why, why wasn't he in years ago? Kansas City and Pittsburgh, two very tough places to win on the road in the playoffs. We just felt like we could do it. I remember the Kansas City game, they're driving down and just the last play of the game, they threw it up and Darren Gordon tipped it up. I, I was trying to intercept it, but he tipped it. And then I looked around because I thought the guy had a chance to catch it. And he did it. I'm like, yes. I remember the Steelers game with Shannon Sharp having to make a clutch catch down the stretch to you know, keep the drive alive and not get them the ball back. Now, those were two amazing games. And they, they were so much fun. And I just I remember the celebrations after the game. It was a beautiful feeling. Facing the defending world champion Green Bay Packers in Super Bowl 32 wouldn't be easy. But then again, nothing about the Broncos' 1997 playoff run was. As a 12-point underdog, Atwater understood the challenge. Stop future Hall of Fame quarterback Brett Favre. Steve did a lot of things in his career. When I look back at his career, one of the uh, things that I think that he treasures the most, and I know I treasure the most, is uh, Super Bowl 32. In that game, if it wouldn't have been for Terrell Davis, I think you would have had the MVP trophy because you played that well. I'll always remember you for that. Third down five. Blitz. Atwater makes the hit. Is it a fumble? If it is, it's Denver's ball. The sack, Brett Ford. I saw the whole play, literally. Steve hit Brett Favre, caused a fumble. It really changed the whole game around that Super Bowl game. They knew that they were in trouble. Well, you know, making that, that key blitz and getting the ball for us, that, that was a huge play, the, especially a game like that. You had to kind of keep that in mind. This is, this is the big, biggest game we're, we're going to play in. We're double-digit underdogs, and our defense came to play, and Steve was the main reason. Steve knocked down two passes. Uh, one of the passes he knocked down, it's a 24-24 game, and if Favre completes it to Robert Brooks, it's gonna be a field goal for the Packers. There are a handful of guys, normally those guys are on defense, that simply from their physical presence, their willingness to deliver a blow, a single blow, that can just change the course of, of the game. And Steve, to me, he was always that guy. In that game with 30 seconds, 37 seconds left, it's third down and six, and Green Bay's got the ball. They better get some heat on, on uh, Favre because they're really not getting close to him. I just remember dropping back into coverage, and I saw Brett Favre throw that pass up, and I just was thinking, I can't let anybody catch this pass. Not right now. Steve knocks out Randy Hilliard. Uh, Brooks goes down, Steve goes down, Ray Crockett was hurt the play before, so here we go into fourth and six, and we got everything on the line. It, the only thing that mattered was to win that game, and I didn't even know that he wasn't even on the field for the last play of the Super Bowl. Like, I was out of it, so I didn't realize that, all right, it's fourth down next. So I, I came off to the sidelines, I'm just sitting there watching the game, you know, not realizing that, hey, if we get off the field here, we win. And so John Mobley steps in front of the pass to Mark Shimura. And I look back at the clock, I'm on the knee. I'm like, wait a minute, they don't, they don't have enough time. 
we win. And everybody else in the stadium, they already knew it, uh, but I'm, I'm probably 10 seconds late. <laughs> he didn't care who was there because he's trying to do everything in his power to help us win the game. And that play helped us, you know, become Super Bowl champs for the very first time in Denver and then go on to win too. He said he got terrific joy and uh, appreciation just watching it all go down. To this day, that's, that's, that was my most exciting moment, realizing that we're world champions, man. We did it together. And I couldn't have been with a better group of guys, better group of coaches. It was just, it was beautiful. To this day, I would maintain that the Super Bowl that Steve Atwater played in Super Bowl 32 was the finest game that any safety in any Super Bowl ever has played. Six solo tackles, one sack, one forced fumble, and that game ending hit. I mean, it, very easy to make a case that he should have been considered for MVP. In 1998, Steve was ready to put together one more playoff run for the team that drafted him nearly a decade prior. The Broncos dominated the league and delivered Broncos country its second consecutive world title. We were trailing in the AFC title game to the Jets at Mile High Stadium. The first half, I think, was like 10 to nothing. Then we, it was like a different team came out of the locker room, offensively and defensively, and really destroyed the Jets in the second half. And I remember right after the game ended, the odds makers in Las Vegas made us eight point favorites over Atlanta, and we just rolled. Atwater was at the prime time of his career. He came out about as close to on top as is possible with back-to-back -back Super Bowl championships. Well, the one thing that Steve Atwater did that uh, that should be noted is that he set the standard. You know, there wasn't any time that you can turn the film on and see 27 not hustling to the ball. This guy is a playmaker. He's going to give all he's got, and he's going to let you know that when you, when you come out there and play against him, it's going to be a long day. He played great in the biggest moment of his life. Game-changing moments. That's, to me, what, what Steve Atwater was about. You know, he is the Denver Broncos. He's in that special group with John Elway and a handful of others that, that took what was a, a franchise that stumbled in the early days and then went through this sort of plateau of just being a good, competitive, exciting team, but just couldn't get over the hump. And he was part of that group that, that took us to the first Lombardi, then delivered one 12 months later. I love the game of football because it brings people together, makes dreams come true, brings the best out of people. It shows people's weaknesses. It shows people's strengths. And it makes, it makes everybody better.